2 of Information Processing Theory. Before we go on to talk about long-term memory, I want to spend a little time talking about a part of the model that isn't even appearing in your textbook and doesn't appear in a lot of other textbooks either, and that is output. Just as a computer has output and can have output problems, so do people. An example of an output problem in a computer is have you ever like had a whole paper all typed into your computer and then when you went to print it out in order to turn it in your printer didn't work? I've had that happen. I've had students come to me and say my printer wouldn't print. I've got it, but that's an output problem. Okay, nothing wrong with the information processing, but you couldn't get the information out to where other people could get to it. The same thing happens to people. So, um, an output problem is really a very common issue in education and training, in athletics, in psychiatric and medical fields, and even in oral reading. Um, for Potential problems that cause output problems are things like physical or psychological production capabilities or difficulties with capability. For example, you may be teaching a child to print, a very young child, and they may process the information on what a B or a Q or an S is supposed to look like, but their hands don't have the fine motor control to do it very well yet. As a matter of fact, this is something that happens to a lot of boys because their fine motor control develops six months or so later than girls does. In athletics, this is very, very common. It's one thing to tell someone how to do a play or how to make a high jump or how to execute a figure skating move or whatever, and it's a very different thing for them to be able to get their body to do that. They process the information just fine, but they couldn't do the production. Another thing that interferes with production is organization issues. If, and this is very common in ADHD, an ADHD kid may process the information pretty well. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but even when they do, they may have difficulty producing the homework or the essay or the test because of production issues. They have trouble uh, one, pro one hypothesis we have about ADHD is that the attention mechanism doesn't work that well so that they're very easily distracted by things. They, that short-term working memory doesn't focus well. A different hypothesis we have is that they actually require more stimulation than regular people do. So that's an interesting thing we can talk about another time. Another thing that can affect production is access to resources. And again, you see this in all of these fields. Um, an athlete that can't afford the shoes they need or the equipment they need, you can teach them all you want, but they can't do what other people can do. The same with a kid who can't afford the school supplies or the computer at home or the internet access and things like that. So one of the difficulties with production problems is that we very often mistake them for information processing problems. And we already talked about handwriting. In other words, the kid who writes very sloppily because they just can't get their hand to do what they want it to do, often their teacher mistakes this for either being careless, not caring about their work, or also just not being as smart. We know that a paper, we've done experiments where we've given teachers papers that were written very neatly and tidily and with all the margins nice and everything, or written sloppily, and they give worse grades to the exact same paper written sloppily. You all know that your papers look better when they're typed up than they do when they're just written out. Mine do too. Another difficulty with production problems being mistaken for processing problems happens with dialect or speech especially with non-traditional dialects like African-American English. Again, the production issue, the fact that the speech is being produced with different tones, is often mistaken for not being as smart in terms of content. Temperament can affect organization, even appearance. Uh, this is what you do when you go to an interview. And there's a guy named Rosenbaum who figured all this out, and he called it signaling theory. And what he's saying is, is that most of the time we don't have the data that we need to make the judgment we need to make. 
So for example, if I'm an employer and I'm trying to hire somebody, what do I want to do? I want to hire somebody who will be dependable and honest and good at doing the work I want to hire them for. Do I know any of that when I interview them? Well, I'll try to get references maybe, but who knows about those. And if I'm relying on the interview, I can't look at somebody and tell you if they're dependable and honest. So what do I do? I look at how they're dressed. I look at how they talk. Now a person who dresses sloppy might be just as dependable and just as honest, but I'm using the signals that I've got. And that was Rosenbaum's theory, is that we use signals for things that don't necessarily really signal what we think they do. Um, and this is very, very common in education. So that the child who is not dressed as well, the child who is dirty, for example, is very often seen as less intelligent when in fact they're simply maybe poor or they're the victims of parents who are distracted by other issues or other concerns. So this is just sort of a sidelight that production and processing are two different things and we often forget that. All right, now on to long-term memory, which is the ultimate goal of education. We want to store things in long-term memory, don't we? Okay, well, back to computers and people. Let's look at different forms of long-term memory. Computers have made a lot of progress in long-term memory. We've got a picture here of the old tape storage that used to be. We've got the floppies. Well, we don't have the real floppy floppies. Those of you who are a little older might remember those. But these are the three and a half inch so-called durable floppies, although, as you all know, the information degrades. And then we've got hard drives. And then down in the bottom corner here, we've got a 20 terabyte hard drive. I don't even want to think of how big a terabyte is in computers. However, this is where we shine as people. We shine incredibly because not only is our long-term storage basically unlimited, but the connections involved, the neural network involved, is infinitely more complex than a computer can manage. All computers, except for some craze, and they're kind of working on those, um, store information hierarchically. If any of you have ever used DOS, you know that basically it's files within files within files. It's a lot like ELC, as a matter of fact, uh, the new, new ELC. Um, and so you have to know exactly which pathway to go to get to that one little bit of information that you want because computers store everything hierarchically. They don't make cross connections. Our brains, on the other hand, have an incredible infinite number of cross connections and we're constantly making more. Our brains do not store hierarchically. They more nearly resemble a neural network. And if I can, I will try to find some pictures that might represent that and share them with you during Hangouts. Um, so that one node, one little tiny bit of information, might be connected through multiple pathways with a thousand other bits of information. So this is where we shine, and this is why people can invent computers as opposed to computers inventing people. Um, we're just smarter than they are in this way, and it certainly is why we're more creative than they are. Okay, so our long-term memory has theoretically unlimited capacity and theoretically permanent dura duration. The folks who do hypnotic therapy will tell you that everything you've ever stored in your long-term memory is there somewhere. It's just, when we say we forgot things, most information processing theorists would say we didn't forget unless we had some kind of an accident like a stroke or something to the brain that actually obliterated parts of the brain. Rather, we just failed to retrieve it when we needed it. Because basically, retrieving from that neural net is a bit of a challenge. But when they do brain surgery, they actually can touch parts of the brain. And people, when, when they do brain surgery on people, people are awake because they need to know where they are in the brain. And they base it on what the person tells them. And so when you touch a certain part of the brain, you can actually re-evoke an entire memory, all whole, like it happened yesterday. It's truly amazing. So the important thing, the big thing here, is that our long-term storage is not just bunches of files of facts and pictures and things, like a computer.
it's all terrifically organized and connected and interconnected. And that matters because when we're trying to teach people, those connections matter as much as the information does. Now let's talk about the kinds of information that we store. Um, information processing theorists have developed lots of different ways of categorizing the information that we store. They make a distinction between episodic and semantic memories. Episodic memories are like the video clips of your life. Semantic memories are knowledge that you know, not things you have lived, but things you know that they are. So, for example, if you take the concept of grandmother, um, your semantic knowledge tells you that a grandmother is the mother of your father or your mother. Your semantic knowledge might know your grandmother's name and address and phone number and maybe parts of her life, history, the fact that she, if she's like my grandmother, um, you know, she's descended from Irish immigrants that came over. All that stuff is semantic. You also have episodic memories of your grandmother if you were fortunate enough to have her alive while you were young you remember what she looks like, you remember things that happened, you remember times that you spent with her, you have little movie clips in your head, you know um, my great aunt Ludi, who was like my grandmother, her house had a certain odor that I always associated with good times because she lived on a farm and there was just something about her house that just smelled different than other houses, I don't know if it was potpourri or what, but whenever I smell that smell, and I have some of her things here, and I'll take them out, and I'll smell that smell, and it brings it back to me. Those are the episodic memories. A knowledge web around a node of knowledge, something like grandmother, is much stronger when it has both episodic and semantic memories. So information processing theory actually leads us here and in many other places toward constructivist theory, which is kind of fun. Another difference in memories, which is sort of connected but not really, is explicit versus tacit or implicit memories. There are some things we remember explicitly. We can recall them when we wish to. We can describe them. Um, most semantic knowledge is like that. However, there's also tacit memories, things that we know that we can't describe very well, things that we know that we don't really even know we know. For example, if, I, if you shut your eyes and I ask you where the R is on a keyboard, you might not know right away or where the, the V is. But if you put your fingers on the keyboard and you move your hand toward typing the V, your fingers will know. Okay? So that's a tacit memory. We have a lot of tacit memories. Most of what we learn as young children is tacit. Um, this is where clinical psychologists definitely focus because one of the purpose of psychotherapy is to take implicit or tacit traumatic memories and make them explicit so they can be dealt with. Okay, another way to divide up the knowledge that we have in our heads is into declarative procedural and conditional knowledge. Declarative knowledge is knowledge that something is. Okay, um, it's facts. How, how hours the libraries open, rules of grammar, that kind of thing, you know, the date of the battle of such and such. Procedural knowledge is knowledge how to do things, and some of that procedural knowledge, as we just mentioned, is tacit, like how to ride a bicycle, how to tie your shoe, try telling someone how to tie your shoe. That's tacit memory. Some procedural knowledge is not tacit. Um, Robert's Rules of Order is procedural knowledge. How are you supposed to do this? You might know this explicitly and be able to explain it to people. How to fix something, how to get to a certain website. Then there's conditional knowledge, which is when. When should you do this? Um, so conditional t knowledge is the essential little piece that tells you when your declarative knowledge is important, when a certain procedure should occur. So that's another way to think about the knowledge in your head. Now, these are not all separate bits of knowledge. Keep in mind they are linked in these networks. 
And when we get to culture, we're going to talk a little bit more about one way to think about those networks called schema theory. Okay, so how does stuff get into long-term memory? Well, we talked about the fact that implicit knowledge gets in sort of without your conscious mind dealing with it. Most behavioral conditioning, remember the behaviorists from last week, most behavioral conditioning occurs on the implicit level. Um, a very good example of this is the parents of children in schools. Parents who themselves did not do well in school will often be reluctant to come in for parent conferences for their children and they won't tell you, they may not even know that it's because they didn't do well in school, but when they get into school they have all the associations, all the feelings, all that, all that episodic memory comes back to them and they feel very uncomfortable and unhappy the same way they did when they were in school. They're conditioned, they have aversive, a classical conditioning reaction to schools. Most behavioral conditioning is implicit. Powerful emotions cause implicit knowledge to go into our memories. Motor skills and other early skills like talking, it's all implicit. Now, here's a really good difference between implicit and explicit and how one can become the other. Because if you, if you teach people, you have to take implicit knowledge and make it explicit. For example, if you're a speech-language therapist, most of us talk with implicit knowledge. If I asked you, how does your tongue sit when you make a T, you're not going to know right off. You can't describe that. But if I'm going to be a speech-language pathologist, I have to take that information and make it explicit so that I can explain it to somebody else. If you've ever watched somebody who's really good on computers and they're doing something and they're tick, 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 and they solve your problem like that and you say, well, how did you do that? They'll say, well, I just knew what to do. And, it, and that's not terribly helpful to you, is it? So if you teach other people, you have to be able to take your implicit knowledge and unpack it and make it explicit. Context is another way, another thing that's involved in getting things into long-term memory so that we tend to remember things in the context we first saw them. Um, for example, if you've ever met somebody and you kind of recognize them, but you think, who is that? I know that person. Who would that be? It, oh, oh, that's the person who um, is the cashier at the restaurant I really I go to all the time. Well, if you see her outside of the restaurant, you may not recognize her because the context isn't the same. Um, context triggers our memory. Testing effects. We have found that kids do better taking standardized tests in the rooms that they learned the material with the teacher that they learned it from rather than in strange places with strange people. It's partly an anxiety effect but it's also partly a context a contextual effect. Organization and elaboration kind of go together. Humans have a tendency to seek and make patterns, and we can also do this very deliberately, such as when we study and put something in a pattern. And elaboration is probably the, the home run of how things get into long-term memory. And elaboration happens when we connect what we're trying to learn to what we already know. It's like there's an empty puzzle piece or an extra hook, and we say, oh yeah, that fits right there. Elaboration depends on the contents of your long-term memory. So once again, people who know a lot learn faster, especially in a field that they know a lot. They learn faster because they already know where the gaps are. They know where this fits. They go, oh yeah, that's there, that's there, that's there. Uh, long-term memory and elaboration, however, can also result in interference, where what goes into your long-term memory is either inaccurate or it just doesn't make it in, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Here's a great example of organization using elaboration. Let's say that I told you that I was going to ask you to decode, I was going to do one of those psychological tests where I'm going to give you a bunch of symbols and you have to decode them into letters. And here are the symbols and here are the letters. Now the trick is though you can't look at the code. So about how long do you think it would take you to memorize what all those letters were for that code? Most people will say something like it might take 10 minutes, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Now I'm going to reorganize the letters and the symbols. They're going to be the same ones, 
but I'm going to reorganize them. Now how long would it take you to memorize that code? No time at all, right? Why? Because you're using two things that you already know. You know the alphabet and you know the tic-tac-toe symbol. And you know the convention that we read from left to right and up to down. So knowing those three things, you can organize that code in no time flat and remember it without any trouble at all. Probably if I tested you on this code in a week, you'd still know it. Again, the rich get richer. The more you know, the easier it is to learn. We did mention, however, that prior knowledge can also interfere with learning. And I can see that we're cutting off the tops of the letters here. I'm sorry. Um, this is what happens when you have prejudice or um, stereotyping going on. People, for example, might have a schema about a particular minority group. They have a certain set of beliefs about them, that they're bad, they're immoral, they're lazy, whatever. And what happens is, is when they receive information that confirms these beliefs, that information is very quickly stored, encoded in memory, because it matches, it fits what you already know. So if they read something in the newspaper where it says that um, a member of a certain minority group stole something or a higher percentage of this minority group is on welfare or something, that information gets encoded very quickly. But if they read something that says that a member of that minority group got a Nobel Prize or um, that more of that minority group serve as policemen than any other group, that information either gets forgotten or it gets twisted. They say, well, that was just an exception. That's not the rule. They refuse that information. And when we look at Piaget next week, you're going to see how that happens. And then, as I said, of course, the, big, the final difficulty is how do you get it back out of long-term memory? If it's in there, it's no use to you unless you can get it back out. The way we think that happens is in the neural network that it's a sort of a spreading activation thing. So one thing will trigger and then it will spread to other things and other things and other things. And we actually think they, they make models of this in a network thing. But there seems to be quite a possibility that this is actually how neurons work in the brain, that there are all these connections out there, and that one neuron excites and its connections to other nearby neurons excite. So what does that mean, basically, for teaching and learning? I mean, it's fun to think about nerves, but we're looking at teaching and learning here. What makes retrieval easier? Things that are more often retrieved are much easier to retrieve. The activation is much faster. This is one of the things that happens with automaticity. Um, things that are more recent are more easily retrieved. We call this the priming effect. Um, so, for example, if I say the word nurse, you're, it's going to be easier for you to retrieve hospital and doctor than it is going to be to retrieve bakery because you don't have any good connections between nurses and bakeries. Um, things that are connected more to other things are easier to retrieve because you're more likely to be able to get to them. There's more pathways. And this is why expertise and depth of processing matter. Depth of processing means how much did you think about it? How much did you elaborate on it? How much did you use it? And therefore, how many little connections did you make in your head? We talked about the unavoidable dangers of reconstruction. When you remember something, it appears neurologically that you don't just trace an old pathway. You actually, in, in a sense, confirm a new uh, or, or confirm it again so that every time you remember something, it changes a little. And you'll notice this in your family. If your family tells stories of what happened years ago, those stories will change over time. One of the things we know in legal affairs, for example, is that if you ask witnesses their stories over and over and over, that story will change as they tell it. So, and then finally, of course, the big puzzle is if it's all in there somewhere, why do we forget? And again, barring anything like a stroke or something, as I said, what we think happens is that things get misplaced or you can't get to them exactly.
If you've ever looked for a file on your computer and it keeps saying the file's not there but you know it is but you can't remember the name of the darn thing, that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Except for there's a lot more in your head than there is in the computer. Finally, the last piece that again is not in your textbook but it's very important is your executive control. What's running the computer? Okay, in a computer, what's the executive control? You are. In fact, Anne Brown, who was an information processing theorist when she worked, she was a very well-known cognitive scientist, brilliant woman, wrote a paper called The Man in the Machine. And she said, you can't ever get rid of the man in the machine. Something's making the decisions. Something's deciding what programs to run. Something's setting goals. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some of that. Okay. Metacognition is one of the things that we do that we don't believe computers do. We think about our own thinking. We try to manage our own thinking. Some of us, most, some of us, some of the time do that very well. We deliberately direct attention. Computers just follow programs. So metacognition is thinking about thinking. The prefix meta means doing something about itself. So if you are meta walking, if you are walking to raise money for your walking club, you're meta walking. Okay? If you're meta studying, you're studying about studying. Right now you're meta learning. You're learning about learning. Okay? So metacognition is thinking about thinking. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then there's learning strategies and strategic learning, which are related but different things. And finally, there's goals, which is the mystery, really, of motivation. Metacognition. Socrates had it right. Twice, mind you. He said, know thyself, and the unexamined life is not worth living. The more you know about your own thinking, the more the students you're trying to teach know about their own thinking, the better they can think. The more they know about how they learn, the better they can learn. Why do people differ in their level of metacognition? Well, first of all, there's development and age. Before the age of seven or so, and again, we're going to look at that with Piaget, kids are really bad at metacognition. If you ask a child of six or seven, a second grader, first grader, um, maybe they have a list of spelling words to memorize, and you say, do you know your, your words? They'll say yes and you test them and they don't. Or they'll say no and you test them and they do. Or you ask which words do you know and they're no good at knowing which ones they know. They're not good at metacognition. We think it has something to do with the development of the prefrontal cortex which takes a very long time. Um, biology or temperament also influences metacognition. Some temperaments are more introverted, they're more introspective and some temperaments just don't look at themselves much. They don't pay much attention to what they're thinking. You're much more metacognitive in an area in which you are an expert. If you're really good at something and I ask you, how do you do this? How do you do that? You know all that. If you're a novice in an area, you might, for example, um, when I'm struggling with a new computer program, a lot of times I'll figure out how to do something and then I don't know how I did it exactly. I'm not yet metacognitive in that area. Perhaps the biggest indicator is the habit or experience of metacognition. Um, people have to learn how to do this. They have to learn how to ask themselves, why did I do that? How did I do that? What, what helped me study that time? What made it harder that time? Why did I remember that? Okay, that's a habit. You, you have to learn how to do that, and you have to learn to do that. And kids learn that the same way they learn everything else. And it's a question also of the expectations of their culture, which includes their family, and the expectations they have of themselves. If you come from a culture where people ask those kinds of questions a lot, then you learn to ask them. This is one of the differences between people who grow up with people who are academically and intellectually inclined and people who don't. Because academics are always asking themselves metacognitive questions. They're always saying things about, you know, why did I do that? How did that work? What am I thinking? 
uh, we can get to be a pain that way, but it's really useful for thinking. So what does that mean? Every person should know as well as they can their own needs, their preferences in learning, their strengths and their weaknesses. What kind of learning are you good at? What aren't you good at? Your own knowledge and the gaps in your knowledge. What are the things you know about? What are the things you still need to know? When are you successful and when aren't you successful at doing things? What strategies work for you? For example, a lot of people in writing recommend that you write an hour a day to get your writing done. I know from long experience I'm not any good at that. That's a lousy strategy for me because it takes me an hour to figure out what I'm writing about and if I stop then I don't get anything done. It takes me an hour to get into it but if I roll for another six hours I get a lot done. You should know your own habits. I have a bad habit of procrastinating. I have a tendency to do this. I know this. It helps a little to know it. And you also need to know your own goals. What matters to you? What are you really trying to do? Or you can just sort of go along doing what you should do every moment. The urgent takes over above the important. So how do we promote metacognition and deeper processing? Active learning. And we're going to be studying that for the rest of the term pretty much. Here's just a few things. You model it when you're teaching. You think aloud, you explain yourself, you say, well, if I had to do this problem, the first thing I'd do is this. And then you see why I said you have to learn to make tacit thinking explicit. You say, well, first I think, is it this or this? And then I say, okay, it's this. So my next step is, and you run yourself, you just talk it through as you do it. You ask students for explanations and arguments and ideas, not just right answers. You give them time to think and discuss. You welcome different methods and new ideas. You don't shut down and say, well, that's not how it says in your book. <clears throat> you pose complicated tasks. <clears throat> and this is something we're going to talk about a lot. With more than one right, one right method and more than one right solution. You offer kids, when you can, second chances to learn, just like those little quizzes you're taking. You have all the chances you want and you encourage reflection. You, you ask kids things like, how did you get to that answer? That's really an interesting painting. How did you decide to design it? I really like the way you've done that. What made you decide to do it that way? You encourage people to be metacognitive. Now there's a lot of times, like right now, when I, you're not that active. You're just sitting here listening to this thing. So what do you do when passive learning seems unavoidable? Well, you help students automate basic skills through informed practice. That's one thing you do. And you all, you've all done this yourselves. When you just have to know something, you have to memorize something, you just practice it a lot. When you have to learn how to do it, you do it a lot. Okay, but you also help students to see connections to their own prior knowledge. One of the ways you do this is by calling up related episodic knowledge. So you'll notice throughout this whole screencast, I've been saying things to you like, do you remember? Have you ever? Has this ever happened to you? You also use multiple channels. <clears throat> you use exposition and narrative. And you use visuals and audio and other things. You spend time on what's important. You don't spend time on things that don't matter. And when you're actually evaluating, you favor understanding over memorization. That helps you from encouraging inert or shallow knowledge. Inert knowledge is when somebody learns something like the French and Indian War was between the British and the French in the Americas and the Indians fought mostly on the French side. Well, that's nice, but if that's just a piece of knowledge sitting out there, that doesn't help them understand history. The question is, why did the Indians fight mostly for the French? What was it and how did that affect the revolution later? The fact that the British had already lost to here well, they won in sort of, but I mean the fact that the colonials had to help the British win here and the, they knew how the British fought had a big influence on the revolution that didn't happen that much later. George Washington was an, got his officer training during the French and Indian War. I'm sorry, I get into history riffs, but what I mean is, is knowing all that is what matters. So if I just memorize when was the French and Indian War, that doesn't get me anything. So all of these principles apply when you are designing materials to be used 
primarily online or digital materials. And the active learning principles we're going to discuss for the rest of this course, basically, when we start looking at constructivist models and um, ways to do instruction. But the passive principles listed here particularly apply when you're designing materials to be used online in primarily a receptive type of learning, which is very common in training or in individualized learning for students. So designing the online materials, once again, you want to connect to students' own prior knowledge and call up their episodic knowledge. You want to use multiple channels, including visual and auditory. You want to use narrative. You want to use um, things that help them feel that you're making connections with them. You want to help students focus on what's important. And you want to help them understand rather than just memorize. You want to encourage deep processing. So for the last part of this week, you're going to take a look at principles um, developed by Richard Mayer to talk about how to design online materials in accordance with some of these ideas.